This is a presentation on right upper quadrant abdominal pain. I'm David Morell, one of the general surgery residents that you will be working with. The first thing to consider with right upper quadrant abdominal pain is to have a wide differential diagnosis. Uh, given that this is a surgery lecture, I'm sure that many of you are going to jump to a certain conclusion right off the bat, but it is important to always maintain a wide differential diagnosis. So I would encourage you at this time to pause the presentation and write down every possible diagnosis you can think of. Okay, now that you've had a minute to consider various causes of right upper quadrant abdominal pain, we'll go through a few of these causes. Uh, first, I'd just like to mention that if uh, ever you're on your surgery rotation and are asked for a cause of abdominal pain, and are drawing blanks, uh, just think about your anatomy training and think about what lives in that area and that'll immediately give you a lot of easy answers right off the bat. So, of course, hepatitis can be a cause of right upper quadrant abdominal pain. The gallbladder lives there, giving us cholecystitis as well as symptomatic cholelithiasis and biliary colic. Cholangitis can also cause right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Uh, pancreatitis, although it is often associated with uh, epigastric pain, can present with right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Now, a little less commonly, uh, you can have pneumonia or empyema pleurisy causing right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Subdiaphragmatic abscesses can be a cause, as well as peptic ulcer disease, gastritis, GERD, myocardial infarction, pericarditis, or a ruptured aneurysm. So after that brief review of the etiology of right upper quadrant abdominal pain, the objectives of this lecture are first to review the relevant anatomy and physiology of organs in the right upper quadrant, as well as to review right upper quadrant pathology and management, specifically cholelithiasis, cholecystitis, cholidocolithiasis, and cholangitis. In regards to biliary embryology, the biliary tree forms from a connection between the hepatic diverticulum and the duodenum, both of these structures are derived from the foregut. The gallbladder is on the inferior surface of the liver, and a portion of the gallbladder is enveloped by the liver. The gallbladder is divided into the neck, infundibulum, body, and fundus, and drains into the cystic duct, which meets the common hepatic duct to form the common bile duct. The common bile duct continues until it meets the pancreatic duct at the ampulla of otter. The triangle of Collot is an important landmark in biliary surgery. I encourage you to pause the video at this time and take a minute to identify the boundaries of the triangle of Collot before resuming the video. The boundaries are the inferior margin of the liver superiorly, the common hepatic duct medially, and the cystic duct laterally. This triangle is important because it helps us to identify key structures during gallbladder removal. The right hepatic artery passes through the triangle and in the triangle divides into the cystic artery, which is at risk of injury during cholecystectomy. In regards to the gallbladder, it is a thin-walled contractile organ covered by peritoneum. It produces half to one full liter of bile per day, with the highest output occurring during gastric emptying. Approximately 95% of bile output is recycled in the colon. Bile contains cholesterol, phospholipid, and conjugated bilirubin. Bile acids consist of cholic acid, deoxycholic acid, and kinodeoxycholic acid. Bile secretion is controlled by CCK or cholecystokinin, which stimulates the gallbladder to contract and the sphincter of Odi to relax. Somatostatin has an inhibitory effect on CCK, resulting in the sphincter of Odi closing with bile refluxing into the gallbladder. The primary function of the gallbladder is to store and concentrate bile, which is accomplished through the absorption of sodium chloride, with water following via passive diffusion as a result. The biliary flora consists of Klebsiella pneumonia, Strep faecalis, E. coli, Clostridium welchi, and Clostridium perfringens. The most common types of bacteria found in biliary infections are the enterobacteria, such as E. coli. Klebsiella and Enterobacter, followed by Enterococcus species. Now that we've reviewed the physiology and anatomy behind biliary disease, we'll move on to biliary pathology. The first thing to understand is that gallstones are very common in the adult population, uh, with cadaver studies demonstrating that approximately 10% of adults uh, having stones at the time of death. 
Of these 10% of adults, only about 1-2% to will develop symptoms. Now you can remember from your Step 1 exam the uh, four Fs of gallstone disease. Uh, first of all with female, uh, relating to female predominance of the disease. Uh, those that are overweight tend to uh, be at more at risk for the disease, as well as those that are fertile uh, or middle-aged. Uh, as a result of this uh, being a relatively common disease, cholecystectomy is the most frequent non-elective operation done in general surgery. And you need to remember that stones alone are an insignificant indication to proceed with surgery. Now, there are two types of gallstones that you will encounter. Uh, this does not necessarily have uh, much clinical significance or impact, uh, but nonetheless is part of the underlying pathophysiology. Uh, with 90% of stones being cholesterol stones, these are green in appearance and are most common in Western cultures and result from the precipitation of cholesterol. Less commonly, uh, pigmented stones, or about 10% of gallstones, uh, are made up uh, of either black or brown stones. Black stones uh, are the result of hemolytic disorders, while brown stones are the result of bacterial overgrowth. Uh, biliary sludge can be clinically significant as uh, it is able to cause symptoms very similar to gallstones. The pathology of gallstone disease stems from both the location of the gallstone as well as the chronicity of the resultant obstruction of the biliary system. So first, in gallstones located in the cystic duct, those that result in early or transient obstruction of the cystic duct cause symptomatic cholelithiasis. If that obstruction becomes permanently blocked, that results in cholecystitis. In turn, when the, the stone is present in the common bile duct with the obstruction being early or transient, that is called cholelithiasis. And then with permanent blockage of the common bile duct from a gallstone, that results in ascending cholangitis as well as gallstone pancreatitis. So we'll spend some time first talking about symptomatic cholelithiasis. As a reminder, this is early or transient obstruction of the cystic duct and results in what is called biliary colic. This is epigastric or right upper quadrant abdominal pain, which may radiate to the back, in particular the right shoulder blade. This is colicky pain, uh, also known as cramping type pain when we say colicky pain. It typically occurs postprandially at about 30 minutes to 2 hours after eating. Uh, however, this is not a universal versal finding. It is exacerbated by fatty foods. I found that when interacting with patients, they don't always recognize uh, which foods are fatty foods. Uh, so often I will talk to them about what happens when they have butter on their toast, uh, or if they have something with a lot of cheese or cream on it, uh, to help them to identify possible fatty foods that elicit the pain from the symptomatic cholelithiasis. Now this pain, uh, this colicky pain, comes from the gallbladder contracting against the stone. And in symptomatic cholelithiasis, this pain resolves spontaneously. Uh, with the onset of pain, patients often describe associated diaphoresis, nausea, and vomiting. With symptomatic cholelithiasis, the signs and symptoms consist of biliary colic that lasts usually less than six hours, with normal LFTs and alkaline phosphatase. When you do your abdominal exam on this patient, it is benign. Now, in surgery, of course, when we talk about benign versus uh, peritoneal abdominal exams, uh, this relates to whether there is extensive inflammation in the abdomen causing peritoneal signs and is a, an important skill for you to develop over your time in your surgery re rotation to be able to differentiate between a benign and peritoneal abdominal examination. Uh, the treatment of symptomatic cholelithiasis is initially non-operative. Uh, a patient arriving with their first episode of symptomatic cholelithiasis isn't necessarily an immediate candidate for surgery. Now, if patients have multiple bouts of symptomatic cholelithiasis that are failing to improve uh, with non-operative therapy, consisting of uh, limiting the intake of fatty foods, uh, then we would consider proceeding with that patient uh, with elective surgery. We'll now move on to discuss biliary dyskinesia. So biliary dyskinesia mimics symptomatic cholelithiasis. However, when you obtain an ultrasound for diagnosis, 
Uh, there are no gallstones present on the ultrasound. So biliary dyskinesia actually results from abnormal gallbladder motility, which causes a relative obstruction of the cystic duct without any actual physical obstruction of that area from a gallstone. This is diagnosed using a HIDA scan. Now it's important when you order a HIDA scan for the diagnosis of biliary dyskinesia that you requ request an ejection fraction. And in this case, an ejection fraction of less than 35% is considered diagnostic. Patients that present with biliary dyskinesia are treated with elective surgery. So we'll now move on to acute cholecystitis. Going back to our initial diagram to remind us of the pathology underlying acute cholecystitis, this is a permanent blockage of the cystic duct, which in turn results in inflammation and infection. So as briefly mentioned, this is sustained obstruction of the cystic duct. This inflammation that results from that causes irritation of the peritoneum, which is in turn results in localized peritoneal right upper quadrant abdominal pain. This can be a progression of multiple episodes of symptomatic cholelithiasis previously in the patient, uh, or it could occur on their very first episode of biliary colic. These patients present with symptoms of persistent right upper quadrant or epigastric pain. So you'll remember with symptomatic cholelithiasis, these are usually self-limited episodes of biliary colic that self-resolve. Frequently patients will describe to you an antecedent history of uh, fatty foods or a meal uh, before the pain came on, and as you talk to them, they endorse anorexia in addition to nausea, vomiting, and then since uh, this is an infectious process, they'll endorse fevers and chills. In regards to the signs, uh, these patients are typically febrile and tachycardic. Uh, when you get your lab workup, they will demonstrate leukocytosis with increased bands, meaning immature immature neutrophils, uh, sometimes referred to as a, a left shift. Uh, when you look at their biliary function tests, you'll see mildly elevated LFTs and elevated bilirubin. Uh, when you do your physical exam of the patient, they will demonstrate a positive Murphy sign. Uh, what that means is when you palpate the right upper quadrant of the abdomen directly over the gallbladder, the patient ceases inspiration when you push on the gallbladder and this is considered to be fairly diagnostic of acute cholecystitis. Now, when one suspects acute cholecystitis, uh, what is the diagnostic test of choice? Uh, so if you need to pause for a minute to think about that before proceeding to the next slide, uh, go ahead and do so now. So the diagnostic test of choice is abdominal ultrasound, and on ultrasound in patients with acute cholecystitis, you'll find distended gallbladder, which is defined as a greater than eight centimeter long axis, as well as greater than four centimeters in diameter. Uh, gallbladder wall thickening is also present, which is defined as greater than four millimeters in uh, width of the gallbladder wall. Uh, you'll also note pericholecystic fluid. Uh, quite often you will note visible stones, uh, especially if you see an impacted stone, meaning a stone present at the level of the cystic duct that does not move as the patient moves. Uh, this uh, should raise your suspicion for acute cholecystitis. Uh, and then given that you're able to directly visualize the gallbladder with your ultrasound probe, you're able to more accurately push right on the gallbladder to elicit what's often referred to as a sonographic Murphy sign, uh, since you are directly visualizing the gallbladder when you push on it for this physical exam finding. Here you can see a comparative images of ultrasound and CT imaging of a patient with acute cholecystitis. Uh, here on the image in the left with the CT, you can make out the stone uh, that causes shadowing because it is hyperechoic. There is some pericholecystic fluid present around the gallbladder. It's distended, and the wall is thickened. So this ultrasound is very diagnostic of a <coughs> gallbladder with acute cholecystitis. Excuse me. On the right with the CT image, you can make out a gallstone as well as pericholecystic fluid. Uh, there's another gallstone present there. Uh, you can also make out some thickening and suggestions of a distended uh, gallbladder. However, CT scan is not nearly as sensitive or specific as abdominal ultrasound is. Uh, finally, in cases of ambiguity 
uh, in establishing the diagnosis, you can obtain a HIDA scan, which is a nuclear medicine scan where a radioactive isotope is injected into the patient, uh, which is passed through the liver into the biliary system and uh, is able to be viewed on sequential images. So here on the left is a normal HIDA scan where you can see the gallbladder fill with the radio tracer. Here on the right is a series of images that does not show the gallbladder fill at any point, indicative of an obstruction of the cystic duct, uh, which would then be considered diagnos diagnostic excuse me, of acute cholecystitis. So finally, the treatment for acute cholecystitis is urgent surgery. Uh, that being said, the moment you make the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis, you should start the patient on antibiotics. Uh, in some patients who are not uh, optimal surgical candidates, uh, meaning that they uh, have some medical comorbidity uh, that would prevent them from safely undergoing surgery, you can consider a percutaneous cholecystostomy tube to decompress the gallbladder. Uh, and then after optimizing the patient, uh, proceed with an elective cholecystectomy down the road. Uh, or have the perc coli drain in place for the remainder of the li uh, patient's lifetime uh, in certain instances. We're going to take a couple minutes now to talk about a couple cases of complicated cholecystitis. Uh, the first is emphysematous cholecystitis. Uh, so this is noted on imaging in which you can note air in the lumen or wall of the gallbladder. And this results from gas-forming bacteria such as E. coli or Clostridium. Emphysematous cholecystitis is particularly of note because these patients are at higher risk of perforation of the gallbladder resulting in more widespread infection. And in general, these patients are older and diabetic. The second special case is gangrenous cholecystitis. Uh, this typically occurs in patients who are older with comorbid conditions. Uh, they present to you very septic uh, with high fever and elevated leukocytosis. And because of the uh, seriousness of this uh, disease process, you need to uh, go for emergent source control, meaning removal of the gallbladder, compared to the urgent uh, cholecystectomy that those with simple acute cholecystitis undergo. Uh, and this reflects the, the uh, risk to the patient's uh, life uh, with morbidity and mortality approaching 16 to 25 percent in these patients. So we'll now move on to discuss cholidocolithiasis. So again, going back to our diagram of the pathology, this is earlier transient obstruction of the common bile duct. Uh, the way this occurs is the gallstone migrates into the common duct from the cystic duct and results in obstruction. This occurs in about 5 to 15 percent of patients with stones. And so what results are the symptoms of cholecystitis in addition to uh, more significant hepatic abnormalities. Uh, so, as alluded to, these patients will report episodes of colic, just like those in uh, symptomatic and acute cholecystitis. Uh, they will have uh, episodes of light colored, colored stools, which we call acolic stools, as well as dark colored urine, almost the color of coke. Uh, these patients uh, will typically present uh, with jaundice, uh, because the bile duct is blocked and preventing uh, the uh, appropriate recycling of bilirubin. And this comes from the hyperbilirubinemia that results from that blockage. Uh, they also have more significant transaminitis than you would expect in acute cholecystitis. Uh, and sometimes they can be a little tachycardic. The way we treat uh, cholidocolithiasis is uh, we remove the gallbladder uh, with an additional procedure that's aimed to clear out the common bile duct. This can be done with a preoperative ERCP, uh, with a sphincterotomy and removal of the stones, or it can be done intraoperatively uh, with stones demonstrated on an intraoperative cholangiogram followed by some type of surgical exploration of the bile duct to clear the stone. Here's an image from an ERCP where you can see filling defects uh, after contrast was injected into the common bile duct. Uh, you can also appreciate that the common bile duct is quite dilated. So this would be an ERCP demonstrating uh, conclusive evidence of cholidocolithiasis, uh, which would then be treated by sphincterotomy and sweeping of the duct to remove the stones. Gallstone pancreatitis is a special subset of cholidocolithiasis where the gallstone becomes impacted at the sphincter of Odi and results in obstruction of both the common bile duct as well as the pancreatic duct. 
uh, this re results in secondary pancreatitis, and actually gallstone pancreatitis is the most common cause of pancreatitis in the United States, accounting for about 35-40% to 40 of episodes of acute pancreatitis. In individuals with gallstones, about 3-7% to 7 of them will develop gallstone pancreatitis. So the symptoms of gallstone pancreatitis are mixed between those of cholecystitis and pancreatitis. These patients will have epigastric right upper quadrant abdominal pain uh, that can radiate to the back. They'll present with fevers and chills and tachycardia. They'll have transaminitis. And then uh, especially important to note the presence of the pancreatitis is uh, ordering amylase and lipase uh, to diagnose the pancreatitis. Uh, the treatment of this uh, condition is surgical, uh, however, uh, the pancreatitis must be treated before you can safely proceed with surgery. So as you have learned or will learn during your medicine rotation, uh, pancreatitis is treated by bowel rest and IV fluid resuscitation. Uh, we put these patients on antibiotics and continue non-operative treatment until the pancreatitis resolves. Uh, we will often have these patients undergo an ERCP before surgery to make sure that the common bile duct is cleared, uh, or alternatively, they can undergo surgery with surgical clearance of the bile duct in conjunction with a cholecystectomy. Traditionally, cholecystectomy is done during the same hospitalization as that for the gallstone pancreatitis. Next, we'll talk about ascending cholangitis. Going back to our pathology diagram, uh, this is permanent blockage of the common bile duct, resulting in the inflammation and infection of uh, ascending cholangitis. Uh, so the pathophysiology of this uh, results from the irritation of the common bile duct epithelium uh, from the obstruction, which leads to translocation of bacteria and infection of the biliary tree. Uh, this leads to biliary sepsis. Uh, in some cases, this is associated with an ERCP, uh, but it's uh, very rare in that regard, uh, with only about 0.5 to 1.7% of cases coming from a, an ERCP. Uh, more commonly, it's from common bile duct stones and uh, sometimes from malignant biliary obstruction. Uh, this is one of the can't-miss diagnoses related to biliary disease, as it carries a mortality rate of 5 to 10%, uh, typically associated with advanced age and comorbidities and delayed diagnosis. Uh, the delayed diagnosis is especially important because in these patients uh, we must strictly adhere to the golden hour of antibiotic therapy and then prompt uh, referral for an ERCP to clear the duct. Uh, in cases of severe ascending cholangitis, the mortality rate approaches a third with 20 to 30 percent of patients dying from this disease process. Uh, so, as this is a can't-miss diagnosis, it's important to understand the symptoms and signs of this disease. So, patients will present with fevers, chills, and rigors, nausea and vomiting, and right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Uh, they'll be hypotensive. They'll have leukocytosis with neutrophilia, hyperbilirubinemia, and transaminitis. Uh, so, Charcot's triad should always uh, tip you off for ascending cholangitis. And these are patients that have fever with chills, right upper quadrant abdominal pain, and jaundice. Uh, Reynolds pen pentad uh, is associated with more severe cases of ascending cholangitis, uh, in which you have Charcot's triad in addition to hypotension and mental status changes. Uh, as I alluded to, the treatment for this is immediate uh, initiation of broad spectrum antibiotics with IV fluid resuscitation and uh, an emergent ERCP to decompress uh, the duct and relieve the obstruction. Uh, this is an emergency. Uh, this is one of the, the few uh, endoscopic emergencies that you actually encounter in this regard, and uh, as a result cannot be missed. Finally, I'm going to briefly mention acalculus cholecystitis. Uh, this is very rare and something that you don't encounter very often. Uh, in fact, it's encountered much more often on exams than in actual clinical practice. Uh, so the name acalculus uh, tips you off to the fact that this is cholecystitis without the presence of gallstones. It's typically seen in ICU patients or, or in patients on TPN. and can be a very difficult diagnosis. Uh, ultrasound is used as the primary diagnostic tool. I think any further understanding of acalculus cholecystitis is probably beyond the scope of a third-year rotation or any of the exams that 
you would uh, encounter, but it is still important to be aware of nonetheless. And that concludes our lecture on right upper quadrant abdominal pain and the disease processes that drive that. Thank you for your attention.